Hi everyone, this is Medina, a car artist and video game developer. In this tutorial, I'm going to walk you through my process of how we can approach texturing leather. We'll create two types of leather using a non-destructive approach, and then we'll combine those two to create a quick third variation. This tutorial is suitable for absolute beginners, and I'll do my best to show you how easy it is to use Substance Painter for character assets. In this lesson, we're going to have a look at how we can create our first material. Here's my reference collection. I'm aiming to create two main materials for this task, similar to this brown full grain leather and this brushed suede. The image viewer I'll be using here is called Pure Ref, and I highly recommend that you get it in your tools collection. In this chapter, we're going to focus on building the suede material first. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look if something similar already exists in Substance Source. Substance Source is a material library where you can find customizable materials created by very good artists. One way to access the library is directly from your browser. The interface is straightforward. Simply go to the leather section and start browsing through the materials. Another way to get access to Substance Source is by using the Substance Launcher. You can download it on substance3d.com slash download. Substance Source tab is available to you here, and the interface looks very similar to the web version. All right. So let's see what we have in the leather section. I'm looking for a material similar to this reference. So I'm just going to position it in front of me so I can quickly compare the content. This could work, but it has some pattern going on. This ones look good. You can click on the thumbnail to check the close-ups. That's quite similar to our reference. Yes, I think that would be a great base for our material. I'm going to go ahead and download it. Click on the SPSAR here and wait for the material to download. You can see the loading bar up here. Once it's downloaded, you will get a notification and you can click on the open folder to locate your material. All right, let's go to our Substance Painter project. I'm going to go to my shelf and drag and drop the material I just downloaded directly from my file explorer. In the pop-up window, set it as a base material, and I'm going to set this resource to be imported on my shelf. There we go. Our downloaded material is now added to our shelf, and we can now use it as a starting point for our suite. Drag and drop this material to your layers. Delete this empty layer, and let's have a look at the parameters available to us with this material. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the tiling of the material. Change the scale parameter here, and try to match the tiling according to your reference. That should work. Next, I'm going to adjust the color. We can start selecting the color from here, or we can pick up color from our reference image directly. Simply drag the color picker and click on your reference. Now, when you sample color from a real life photo, bear in mind that the image has a lot of lighting information, not to mention that the photo might be graded, overexposed, and so on. Therefore, the sampled color is going to be just an approximation of your diffuse value. It's a great starting point, but it often needs to be tweaked. 
Once I'm happy with the color I picked, I'm going to check how it looks with the different lighting. Under the display settings here, you can change the lighting by changing the environment map. I'm quite happy with the base. Now, let's have a look at how we can make our diffuse a bit more interesting. I'm going to bring in my reference so I can have it in front of me. So what we have at the moment is something very flat. If you look at the reference though, you can see that there are some darker and brighter spots all over the surface. We can actually very quickly replicate that by using some procedural textures that come along with Substance Painter. Let's start with the bright spots. Create a new layer and turn off all the material channels except color. Select a slightly brighter color from your reference. Now, the goal is to add to this layer a cloud-like mask that will have a similar pattern to these bright spots. Bring in your shelf and navigate to the procedural tab. I'm going to make my thumbnails larger so that it's easier to see. There are quite a few cloud and noise textures available to us. Look for one that is closer to your reference. I'm going to go and try clouds too. Right-click on your bright layer and choose Add Bitmap Mask. In the pop-up window, type Clouds and find your texture. If you don't see much of a difference, chances are your mask textures need some adjustments. If you hold Alt and click on the mask, you'll be able to see how the mask looks like. To adjust the mask, Select your texture under the mask and go to the Properties window. Now, in my case, I need to tile my mask more. Let's see what that gives us. Exit the mask view by clicking on the layer. The spots are more obvious now, but they're way too large. I'm going to invert my mask and play with the balance slider here till I get something closer to my reference. We can also go up here and adjust the intensity of the layer. That's not too bad. I'm seeing that there are some bright directional lines here and there. Let's add those two, but let's add them on a separate layer. I'm going to rename my layer and click Ctrl D to duplicate it. Right click on the mask and choose Clear Mask. As you can see, the mask is now black. Bring in your shelf and find a texture that could replicate the effect we want. Again, I'm trying to find something that has some directional lines. Let's check the grunges tab too. The crunch dirt splats could work. Let's see how would that look. Same steps as before. Right click on the layer and choose Add Bitmap Mask. In the pop up window, type the name of the material we just found. Crunch dirt. There we go. I 
Alt click on the mask to preview the mask by itself and tweak the mask till you're happy with the results. All right, that starts looking more and more interesting. Let's go ahead and add some large, darker spots that we can see in our reference. The process is exactly the same. Create a new fill layer. Choose a texture. I'll go for this Grunge Map 007. Right-click, add a bitmap mask, and type the name of your texture. I'm going to decrease the intensity straight away and tweak the parameters of my mask. Here you can see that I'm playing with the tiling, offset, and the intensity of the layer. That's not too bad, but now I feel that the bump might be a bit too large. We're going to go ahead to our base layer and adjust the tiling. That's much better. Don't forget to rename your layers to keep the structure nice and clean. Now, next thing I want to do is I want to emphasize the tips of the fibers. That is how the very top area of the fibers are slightly brighter. The thing is, I'm quite happy with our base texture and I wouldn't want to mess it up. It would be nice to be able to control the tips separately. We can do that by setting up a separate layer that will have a mask that will only pick up the very top areas of the fibers. Let's see how we can do that. I'm going to create a fill layer and add a smart mask that picks up the edges. This edge strong mask should do the trick. Simply drag and drop it to the layer and let's see what we got. As you can see, the mask did a good job picking up the sharp edges of our jacket, but it didn't take into account our little fibers. The thing is, the smart masks are calculated based on the base textures, those that we baked in the beginning of our project. The smart masks are agnostic to all of the additional bump that we authored in our layers while trying to express the surface. What we need to do is, we need to tell the mask to consider this additional height and normal information when generating the edge map. We can do that by using the anchor points. Go to the layer that holds the small bump information. In my case, it's the bottom layer. You can toggle the visibility on and off to find out if the bump is coming from here. Right-click and choose Add Anchor Point.
Now select the mask and go to the mask editor. Find the micro detail tab. And set the micro height and micro normal to true. Now scroll all the way down and click on micro normal. In the pop-up window, go to the anchor points tab and select your anchor point. There we go. Now the mask is picking up the fibers and we can go ahead and control them separately. I'm going to sample some bright pixels from my reference and perhaps lower the intensity of the whole layer. I think the fibers look a bit too large at the moment. We can try and make the mask a bit tighter. Go to the mask editor and adjust the global balance parameter. That's a bit better. Play with the color and the layer intensity till you're happy with the results. That's not too bad. Let's rename our layer to something like Fiber Highlights. And this is it. Our suede material is now ready. At this point, you can continue fine-tuning the layers till you're happy. If you click on this camera icon here, you can render the jacket using the eye renderer. That will allow you to check the results with a better lighting accuracy. If you're happy with your material, you can now save it as a smart material and use it in the future projects. Create a group. Select the top layer, shift select the bottom, and drag the selection to the group. Rename the group to something that makes sense. Right-click and choose Create Smart Material. There we go. Our material has been saved in our shelf. We can use it in the future projects. I'm going to save my file now, and in our next lesson, we're going to have a look at how we can create our next material.